Well, we're back again, and this is the final, the tenth lecture in the Introduction to Radar Systems uh, course. And this uh, lecture will be on radar transmitters and receivers. Here's an outline of the different topics we're going to discuss. Will there be an introduction? First, we'll talk about radar transmitters. Then we'll move on to the waveform generators and radar receivers section. And then we'll look about the different architectures that you can put together radar receivers and transmitters in uh, that are available and, uh, and their system implications and why they're used one way or the other. And then we'll finally we'll summarize. Okay, well here we are, back again for the tenth time at our block diagram. Uh, you can see highlighted in this box are the sections of the uh, radar system that we're going to talk about today. The waveform generator, where we generate the signal uh, for the first time. It's, tr it's uh, amplified in the transmitter and then goes out through a device called a duplexer. Whenever you see duplexer, think switch because we don't want that very large transmitter signal to go into the receiver while we're transmitting and vice versa. This switch will isolate the transmitter from the receiver. And then also there'll be the receiver section and the signals will either be going from the transmitter out the antenna or the received echoes will be coming back from the target through the, dipl the duplexer and into the receiver. Okay, here's a simplified block diagram of the transmitter just so you can see it big picture. Okay, And you see that we've got a waveform generator where we generate what, what, what's a small signal and it's, it's generated at a, usually a lower frequency than we finally transmit and it, it's converted up to a higher frequency but before we do that we amplify the signal filter it and then we go out through the duplexer a switch that's uh, you'll see in a minute why that switch needs to be there in great detail and then out through the transmitter the echo comes back where it's filtered and then we amplify the signal send it into the receiver and then we digitize it into a signal that we can uh, process and detect the echoes of the targets. The radar transmitters and receivers can be divided into these two important subsections. The, the high power transmitter section and the low power section. The low power section is of course the receiver because the echoes coming back are very weak. And this just gives you an idea of the size of the signals. The waveform generator signals are very small to begin with tens of milliwatts to a watt is the, and then after we uh, uh, up convert them we'll there will be a very high power transmitters section where we'll amplify the signal very strongly uh, it'll go from these the order of uh, ten, fractions of a watt up to millions of watts thousands and millions of watts so that amplifier makes the signal much much larger and, uh, and then the echo that comes back is tiny, very, very tiny. Millionths of a watt, microwatts to milliwatts. And then it is amplified and received, as I mentioned earlier. Okay. Now, with looking at the radar equation, and this is probably the only, this is the only equation we'll look at in this lecture, um, I want to focus on the importance of uh, the power of, of the things that we're going to do in this section. The most important thing we obviously want to do is maximize the signal to noise ratio, how strong the target is relative to the noise, and because that's a very strong function of how far we can detect a signal. And we can, we have three things in the transmitter receiver chain that come into play in, with, in the radar equation. The average power of the radar, and then the uh, system noise temperature and the system losses. And these two down below we want to keep as, uh, um, as low as possible. Uh, excuse me, we want the loss to be, this to be unity and the transmitter, the noise system noise temperature to be low. 
and uh, want the losses to be zero, ideally, and we want the power to be infinitely high if we could. The big deal is it's hard to get very high power, and it's very hard to have very, very low system losses. You have to work really hard at these things. So the signal to noise can be enhanced if we have higher transmitter power, if we have low system losses, and we minimize the system noise temperature. Okay. Now let's look at high power amplifiers for a couple of minutes. What are we doing when we amplify the signal? We start off with a very low, low signal from the waveform generator, and then we amplify usually in a series of stages. The first set of stages are called driver amplifiers, and they amplify somewhat. They don't do the gigantic amplification in the high power amplifier. And we do this, these in with a series because the, w there are limitations to the amount of amplification you can get per stage. And we want to do this with the lowest, have each stage of amplification be with the lowest possible noise and the minimum distortion to the input signal. And it isn't as though one amplifier can supply all of the amplification we need. So we have to do things in stages. Uh, okay, And we also can, can put um, amplifiers architecturally different than this set we see in, in series. We can put them in series and have like a, a waveform generator, a driver amplifier, and then a high power amplifier, and then the signal going out to the antenna. Or we could take a waveform amplifier, a driver amplifier, and then send that signal, divide it up into an, a series of high power amplifiers, and then combine the, the, the output of these into it, it with a summing mechanism, an addition mechanism, and send the uh, signal out the amplifier. Now, so we can use it, we can um, increase the power by combining signals in parallel. But we're going to have efficiency problems if we do that. We have lower efficiency because there are going to be losses in the combiner here, the high power combiner, and this increased complexity when we do that. In addition, if one of these high power amplifiers has a problem, uh, there can be imbalances between these, and we can get reflection signals going back, which require compensation circuits. And it, it, there's an increased complexity in the transmitter if, if we have the high power amplifiers in parallel. But many systems do quite effectively use this technique. This is just to point out that it's, it's one of the downsides of combining amplifiers. Instead of having three stages in parallel, it's three stages in series, excuse me, putting the three in parallel. Okay. Uh, there are different types of amplifiers themselves. There are vacuum tube amplifiers, and there are solid state amplifiers. We think of, uh, in, 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 say, 50 years ago, there was a, a cylindrical glass tube, a vacuum tube amplifier that worked in radios. Now, in the 1960s and the 50, late 50s, 60s, transistors and integrated circuits came in, solid state amplifiers, and that allowed us to have things much smaller. But there are upsides and downsides when we build microwave system, microwave high power amplifiers for both of these. Now, for a long time, we've had uh, vacuum tube amplifiers, and they use different physical mechanisms uh, to do that amplification, and the different vacuum tube amplifiers have different names because of how they're constructed. Some of them are called traveling wave tubes, klystrons, and that sort of a th thing, uh, cross-field amplifiers. Other devices, uh, solid-state amplifiers are just called that. They're, they're made with solid-state with high-power trans transistors. Uh, the solid-state systems tend to operate with a um, at, at lower average power, at lower peak power, okay, and uh, and with higher duty cycle. And the vacuum tube amplifiers tend to operate at very high peak power and with very low duty cycle. 
and the cost per unit is very high for these vacuum tube amplifiers that you can see one va uh, vacuum tube amplifier a traveling wave tube can cost three to four or five hundred thousand three or four or five hundred thousand dollars solid state amplifiers individual ones on the other hand can be in the hundreds of dollars but um, uh, for an individual amplifier but when you package them together in a whole transit transmit receive module and look at the cost per watt that comes out uh, it's quite different for vacuum tube amplifiers the cost per watt that you get out of the whole system for the amplifiers at one to three dollars per watt but you can uh, if you're using transmit receive modules which effectively are other parts of the transmit too the solid state amplifiers can run you up to hundred dollars a watt or more uh... the, the size these vacuum tube amplifiers are huge they can be a, a foot in diameter and three feet tall just the amplifier itself and then they have very powerful power supplies that are uh... many many cubic feet the solid state amplifiers have a very small footprint the applications these are high power systems and as i i didn't point out probably enough early on when I'm, I'm talking about this they they have very high power you know, up to a megawatt and more per uh, of uh, power output and the solid state amplifiers are a few hundreds of watts at most in their use the vacuum tube amplifiers are used with dish antennas and with passive arrays and I'll get into what passive arrays are in a moment when I look at the architectures and solid state amplifiers fires are used in active arrays and digital arrays so called uh, another form of phased array system now when we look at the um, what f frequency regimes and what powers are available with today's technology and this is in rough terms uh, when you're looking at very high power very very high power uh, the tube amplifiers dominate over the whole microwave region. If you've got to build a radar that's very, very high power, uh, they they dominate. Uh, or you're going to pay an enormous amount of money because you're going to have a huge number of solid-state amplifiers. There's a region of competition, and then solid-state amplifiers, and this is talking about on an individual basis, not as a whole system, they'll dominate in the, uh, the lower power region. Now, of course, you can build uh, systems that have high average power. They take an awful lot of amplifiers to generate that kind of uh, power. Okay, now let's look at some examples. The, the tube amplifiers, klystrons and traveling wave tubes are the two most common. And for solid state amplifiers, they use solid state power trans transistors. There are different criteria for choosing a high power amplifier. Just what are the different ones? If you want average power output as a function of frequency, the bandwidth of operation, the duty cycle, if, you, if you're satisfied with a very uh, narrow duty cycle, a two, and a dish is uh, you're going to be using, a tube radar might be just the ideal radar for you, the lower cost. Um, uh, the gain of the antenna, the mean time between failure, etc. It's a very complicated trade-off when you choose one versus the other. Okay. Now, first, I'd like to show you an example of a tube uh, radar. Uh, the, uh, this particular radar is at Millstone Hill in Westford, Massachusetts. It was designed in the early 1960s and it uses a couple of klystrons, two of them, and it operates at L-band, that's a frequency of about 23 centimeters, uh, about 1300 megahertz, and it's got a peak power of 3 million watts and an average power of 120 kilowatts. That reaches out there. And here's a picture uh, of the dish antenna that's connected to in the building down here is the transmitter and you'll see that in a moment and that antenna diameter is 84 feet. Here is a picture of the transmitter room give you a size of the hugeness. Uh, the, the klystron that is used in this um, radar 
costs four hundred thousand dollars per tube. It's built by Varian. It's seven feet tall. Here's the uh, the the, uh, the 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 system itself. There's a vacuum, the uh, klystron, and there are coolant hoses because enormous power is going through. Of course, it's not perfectly efficient, so there's a certain amount of heat generated that you've got to uh, bleed off, or the whole system would melt. There's very large waveguide. 200 feet of waveguide goes from the transmitter out to the uh, antenna. There's a one kilowatt peak power solid state driver amplifier. There's a whole room that houses the uh, power amplifier itself. There's a spare tube here and uh, all sorts of stuff. You can see this is big radar. Uh, it has a gain of uh, 42 dB. That's a gain of 10,000 with a low duty cycle. 3% of the time it can be on. Weighs 600 pounds, 7 feet by a foot, just to give you a physical size of the beast. Okay. There are other types of uh, tubes called traveling wave am uh, amplifier, TWTs, traveling wave tubes. And here are pictures of two of them. They have also happened to be built by Varian. Uh, one at S-band and one at X-band. And uh, let's just first look. This S-band uh, traveling wave tube, um, its uh, center frequency is 3.3 gigahertz. S-band, I'll remind you, is a wavelength of 10 centimeters. And it has a bandwidth of 400 megahertz. And it has a peak power output of 160 kilowatts with 8% duty cycle. Again, around 43 dB. Uh, about uh, 20,000 is the gain. And here four of them are stacked up and run in parallel and that were built into an SBN transmitter. And uh, with some of the associated equipment in the, this is eight feet tall for dimensions, you could see. They're big tubes, okay? And here there is an, a, an, an example of an X-band uh, traveling wave tube, coupled cavity traveling wave tube. It's got a gigahertz of bandwidth, 10% bandwidth, peak power of 100 kilowatts with 35% duty cycle. That means 35 kilowatts of power come out of this, and it's got a gain of 10 to the fifth, 100,000. It's got a gain. Wow. Powerful animal. Now let's look at solid state transmitters. Here's one that was built by the laboratory. Uh, the ra uh, Radar Surveillance Technology Experimental Radar, its acronym is RISTER. It's a solid state transmitter and the power uh, uh, amplifiers, uh, power amplifier modules are in this rack. 14 channels of power with uh, 140 kilowatts of total peak power, 8 kilowatts of average power. And you see there's a, a higher um, duty cycle than in the other systems. And each channel is supplied by a power amplifier module, 10 kilowatts of peak power. Okay. The first uh, active solid state radar, active aperture system, is called Pave Pause. And this is a picture of that. It's huge, 75 foot diameter. Uh, as you remember about phased arrays from the, phase to the antenna lecture, uh, there are a whole load, 1,792 of them, active transmit receiver modules, each one with uh, 340 watts of peak power. There are four, uh, a number, I think it's four, three, three transistors in parallel, I believe, three or four, I'm pretty sure it's three, and they're lined up in parallel, and uh, the transmitter and the receiver are different pieces of the box. And this, uh, these systems are very reliable, well over 100, I think 150,000 hours of mean time between failure for this system. And um, this particular radar is located uh, on Cape Cod and it does uh, ballistic missile early warning. Okay, and it's built by the Raytheon company. Now let's talk a little bit about duplexes. Why is the big deal with duplexes? I'll put all three lines on here at once. Well. We put out this transmit signal, and then we listen for the echoes. And during that window, we're listening very carefully for an echo that's very small. These little spikes correspond to when we're sampling at a different time delay after the transmit signal. We're listening to see if there's a very uh, 
small radar echo. We do that for a while, and then we transmit again. Now, and so what that means is we're transmitting for a while, and then we receive. Now, the total time between we start to transmit and we start to transmit again, we call that the pulse repetition interval. But the thing I want to focus on is we do not want this transmit. When we're transmitting, we do not want any signal to get into the receiver. So we want to switch out there. And that switch is the duplexer. Okay, do we use duplexer switching to isolate? How much isolation are we talking about? Transmitters typically can transmit peak power signals from 10 kilowatts to a megawatt. Megawatt, think of that. And the received signals can be tens of microwatts to a milliwatt. So we're talking about 90 dB approximately you can have. Nine orders of magnitude. We want that switch to isolate one from the other. If you remember back to the first lecture, we saw that the in the chain home radar that the transmitter was located in a different physical location by hundreds of feet. In those days, they weren't great at building uh, duplexers. So they put the transmitter physically distant by hundreds of feet from the receiver in many cases. Okay? The, the, so the technology is not easy to make something 90, nine orders of magnitude of isolation between the transmitter and the receiver. So that's the very important function of the duplexer. Now let's just look about it in a little more detail so it can sink in. Well, when we have the transmitter on, we connect the antenna to the transmitter, and we want to do that without any loss. We want the high power energy from the, the energy from the transmitter to go right through that switch and out the antenna with no loss. We want to have nothing going back into the receiver. We've got to protect that very sensitive receiver that's used to used to listening and detecting million microwatts from megawatts and kilowatts. So we want to turn that off. And then on receive. We want to connect the antenna through the duplexer to have a limiter switch to make sure if stuff does leak in, God forbid, we don't fry the receiver. We want the transmitter, of course it's going to be turned off. We want to have an additional, this limiter switch for additional protection, say against strong interference from a nearby signal. And so that's the switching, that's the function of the duplexer. It's got to cut out completely nine de orders of magnitude the signal. So that's the, what that duplexer does. So when you hear the word duplexer, you know it's not just like your switch on uh, the light bulb. It's a very different entity.